Welcome. Welcome, everybody, um, to our webinar on the way to Lima and Paris, the youth role in international climate policy. Um, the, the topic of the day is very clear. What perhaps needs to be said in addition to what was in the announcement of the webinar is that obviously we are on the eve of the climate summit organized by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon that will take place tomorrow. Um, so that is something that we may wish to touch upon in our discussions. Um, I would like to briefly present the, the three uh, speakers in addition to myself. Um, my name is Sebastian Oberte, by the way, uh, of the Institute for European Studies at the Freie Universität Brüssel. Um, with me here in Brussels are Maurizio Di Lulu, who is working at the Secretariat of the Council of the EU dealing with climate policy there. Um, Lisanne Groen, who is also working as a researcher at the Institute for European Studies at the Freie Universität uh, Brüssel. And um, we have with us also in Paris, Thomas Spencer from the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, where he's Program Director, Energy and Climate. Hello, Thomas. Um, it's Fascinating to have this kind of experiment uh, with the webinar. This is the first time that at least I'm doing it, and I'm looking forward to the experience. Um, I suggest that we'll have the presentations first. We all have uh, prepared a few points, uh, and then enter the discussions. You're obviously free to um, pose your questions um, via via the, the keyboard, etc. Um, uh, but we may take them up after we have spoken. Um, yes, so let's get uh, started with our webinar, which is uh, one in a series of webinars, uh, Diplomacy in Action, it's called. It's under the Germany Chair Project Springboard Brussels 2015. That also needs to be said. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Maurizio to take the floor uh, and give his uh, views on the role of the EU towards Lima and Paris. Please. And then... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 hello, everybody. Um, so uh, let me start maybe with uh, a, a short state of play of the international climate negotiations. Uh, it's now uh, almost 10 years or 10 years that we are building on the existing uh, international climate regime that we have of the United Nations Fra Framework Convention to uh, make it fit for the 21st century. We started back, uh, for those who remember, in 2004. Uh, that was in Buenos Aires with something called the SOGI. That was a seminar of governmental experts. We went through the Bali mandate in 2007 that was a little bit flawed and, and resulted in uh, uh, the, the Copenhagen conference. And uh, finally, in 2011, we had then the Durban mandate, uh, which is the basis for the negotiations we are in now. Where are we now? Uh, well, we have two co-chairs from uh, uh, the, the body who deals with uh, uh, these negotiations, the ADP. Uh, the ad hoc Durban platform. Um, and these have presented uh, uh, back in July uh, the parties' views and proposals on the elements for a draft negotiating text. This should in the end result in uh, the Paris Agreement in December 2015. So we will need to go through a couple of phases there because uh, we will need to go first through Lima uh, at the end of the year. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, in May next year, we will then have a first draft of the agreement itself. And then finally, in Paris, December next year, we'll have the final agreement. Hopefully, it will be finalized not too many days after the 11th of December, which is the, uh, the, 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 the due end date. Um, so to start with uh, Lima and the process we are in now, um, what do we need to do? What, what is the homework? Uh, well, first of all, we have uh, to put forward what is the, the, the core of the agreement. That is what we've called back in Warsaw, the intended nationally determined contributions. So uh, that means that in Lima, there will, be, there will be need to be a decision on a template for uh, the requirements, the up, what we've called the upfront information requirements 
for those intended nationally determined contributions. Um, there will need to be clarity on timing and scope of these uh, uh, intended contributions. And then we will need to see how we analyze, how we consider those uh, intended contributions between the moment that they are put forward and, and uh, the, the, the Paris conference. Uh, now, anticipating already some of the discussions uh, for, for, for Lima, uh, uh, one of the big issues uh, is what should these uh, intended nationally determined contributions contain? Uh, we in the EU, we thought it was clear in Warsaw that it was uh, uh, clearly aimed at mitigation, but apparently others in the, in the international uh, negotiations have another view, and so this will need uh, to, be, to be discussed in Lima because we need to reach agreement in Lima on what kind of format, what kind of template we want for the different information requirements for, for uh, nationally determined contributions. Um, the second element for Lima is that we will need to agree or at least identify elements for the 2015 agreement. Right now we have on the table the, the text of, 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 of the co-chairs, the ADP co-chairs, which is kind of uh, a very good summary of uh, uh, an analytical summary of the, 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 the views of parties. But we will need to narrow that down and to come to something that we can work on in, in, in order to, to make uh, the real agreement in, in a couple of months, uh, the first months of 2015. The third element, I would say, for Lima is the pre-2020 mitigation ambition uh, and a decision related to that. Uh, it's clear that, I mean, uh, we never have to uh, 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 lose sight of the fact that what we're working towards is towards reaching the ultimate objective, the ultimate, ultimate objective that we've defined as staying below two degrees. If we wait until 2020 and until uh, the 2015 agreement comes into force, it will be too late. So we need to, uh, to put in place and to take the necessary actions already now. And that's what we're trying to do with this decision that will also be important for Lima. Fourth and last element for Lima, that is the implementation bit. I've said in the beginning, it's already 10 years that we're working on uh, uh, building on an existing regime to make it fit for the 21st century. But we shouldn't lose sight that we also need to do implementation. That the most important part is implementation. And so one of the important elements uh, for, for Lima will be this multilateral, assess multilateral assessment round where we will assess uh, uh, countries progress towards achieving their 2020 targets or commitments. And uh, importantly as well, we need to agree on the rules for uh, uh, the implementation of the second commitment period of the, of the Doha Amendment, because without those rules, uh, uh, the, the parties which want to, to, to ratify the, the, the second commitment period and to implement it will not have this uh, international framework to do so. That are the most important elements for Lima, the four essential elements I see there are undoubtedly others, but these are the four that I wanted to put uh, forward and that I wanted to emphasize. Um, going towards Paris then, uh, that's still uh, a long way to go, but still uh, uh, Paris needs to deliver an agreement addressing what, we, what we've called all the building blocks, mitigation, adaptation, capacity building, technology, transfer, finance, etc. As I said, the most important element here is the two degrees objective, uh, the ultimate object, the translation of the ultimate objective of the convention. We see already now that with what is on the table, we are not likely to get there immediately. So that means that uh, one of the essential elements of uh, that agreement will need to be a kind of uh, a cycle for mitigation commitments, for upward review, upwards uh, uh, ratchet up of, 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 of commitments. Um, it will probably be important as well that we reflect uh, uh, until Paris on the legally binding character of everything, what needs to be legally binding, what would the purpose of that be, uh, uh, and so on. And Important element also in view of Paris is the fact that we need multilateral rules to govern this all. Um, because we need to uh, uh, know the rules to be able to, to, to put forward commitments as well. So that means that probably we will need to have the overarching rules on, for example, MRV, accounting, compliance, already in place and agreed in the Paris Agreement or in related decisions and that we will need to leave the detail 
for uh, uh, later years in the run up to, uh, uh, to the entry into force of the Paris Agreement. Now, what we can already see now, of course, is that uh, Paris will probably not deliver the maximalist agreement that the EU would like it to be. Uh, but we need to make sure that what we have is something that we can build on and that it doesn't uh, close doors prematurely. Um, important as well, and that is learning from the experience from Copenhagen, I guess, is uh, in these negotiations, the EU will not be a problem. Uh, because uh, I've often heard uh, in Copenhagen, the EU was completely sidelined. I would say the EU was the only one not having any problem and being the, the ambitious uh, partner. That will happen as well here, I guess. Um, but what is important, learning from the Copenhagen uh, experience, is that we get a clearer picture as soon as possible. And that, uh, I mean, in the run-up to 2015, we uh, uh, decide on some of the, of, of the key elements, or at least have clarity on some of the key elements, and not go to Paris with a blank page. To uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, say some uh, words on two of the elements, uh, two of the meetings that we have right now, tomorrow the Ban Ki-moon summit, and uh, uh, at the end of this month the uh, ADP session in Bonn. For the uh, Ban Ki-moon summit, I would say this is the first time that world leaders will meet after Copenhagen. I think most of them remember Copenhagen, so they will want to kind of uh, uh, make sure that uh, they create a momentum, they maintain a momentum at the highest level until Paris, uh, knowing that in Paris world leaders will not be there. Um, it will be important according to me, and that it would be for me one of the, 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 the big deliverables of this conference, that world leaders reconfirm their commitments uh, most of the major economies, but all of them uh, uh, for uh, following the ambitious timetable agreed in Warsaw, uh, and uh, preferably the most ambitious timetable, which was putting forward the intended nationally determined contributions in the first quarter of next year. We see now uh, uh, in the in the submission of the of the of the U.S. Uh, last week that they will do so. Uh, we hope that others uh, will follow suit. I mean, you know that the EU is also doing its homework right now and we uh, uh, are uh, also sticking to this uh, to this uh, to this deadline that we've set ourselves uh, in uh, in Warsaw and last but not least Ban Ki-moon summit can also deliver something on pre 2020 mitigation ambition you know that there are specific statements projects multilateral regional and other projects and statements on carbon pricing on agriculture on forests on hfcs on transport so all sectors that are uh, quite important in terms of, of, uh, of mitigation ambition. Lastly, uh, on the ADP session in October, uh, that will be a very important session because it's the preparation for uh, the last preparation, the last meeting for Lima. There we really need to make progress on uh, the three issues that we have on the table. That is, one, the ADP co-chairs uh, landscape text, text, where we need to debate on the options, try, try to narrow them down, and uh, make sure that we present uh, uh, ministers in Lima with the choices that need to be made there. Uh, we also need to uh, work further on the pre-2020 mitigation ambition decision texts in order to have a, 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 a credible and ambitious text uh, in Lima, which uh, kind of uh, make sure that this work program on pre-2020 mitigation ambition is extended because there are still some uh, six years to go. And lastly, uh, last but not least, we have the, the uh, upfront information requirements uh, uh, text, decision text that needs to be uh, discussed and uh, preferably agreed. It would be a, a, a very good signal if it could be agreed uh, already in uh, Bonn in October. Uh, even it will, if it will be hard, because uh, we have this outstanding issue, as I said, of what we understand under in, uh, intended nationally determined contributions. So uh, that is one of the things that needs to be sorted out. But uh, a last word on this, I think this is a very important exercise and would also be a proof of goodwill of developed countries in the sense that 
uh, going into this exercise, it would be an operationalization of the principle of equity, of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Because every country puts forward its intended nationally determined contribution on the basis of its national circumstances, taking into account a, a high level of ambition, of course. And on this basis, uh, for example, the, the requirements for upfront information uh, would be defined then, and later on, MRV and accounting rules would be defined. So I think that uh, getting agreement on this uh, as soon as possible, preferably at, at the bond session, would be uh, would be a, a signal that we are uh, on the on the right track towards uh, Lima and, uh, and Paris. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Maurizio, for for this input, and you will certainly have a chance to come back and we can discuss what realistically uh, can be the outcomes of the meetings of the coming days and uh, months and the coming year. Uh, let's turn immediately to Lisanne. Um, and uh, please give your input. You have the floor. Okay. okay. Uh, I would like to tell you something about uh, the constellation of the different negotiating blocks in the negotiations. Um, you see the well. There's the European Union, and then of course you have a whole spectrum of, of other parties around it. And where does the EU find itself at the moment? Uh, there is the a uh, group now of the like-minded developing countries, the LMDCs. That group basically uh, appeared after the negotiations in Durban in uh, 2011 in December. So um, in uh, 2012, this group uh, um, came about. It was China, India, uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Bolivia. Um, and this group has actually gained in strength since, uh, since it uh, appeared and has been able to undermine quite a lot of the European Union's ideas, and especially in Warsaw, in the last uh, conference of the parties meeting. Um, and yeah, actually, the the goal of the um, of the group is mainly to to block uh, to block an ambitious uh, agreement that the European Union would like to have. Um, so this legally binding global deal. Um, they try to delay this stepwise approach that the EU brought forward uh, in um, in uh, Warsaw um, on mitigation, and uh, uh, actually, as an uh, as a result of this, the text has become a bit more um, more um, vague than the EU would have liked. Um, uh, however, the um, the the group, the LMDCs, uh, is not that uh, coherent. Um, it does not have uh, clear similar uh, interests and um, many of them uh, as I as I already said have have uh, the interest to to wreck parts of the deal that uh, EU and other more ambitious uh, parties would like to see uh, if we then go to uh, other uh, groups and ne negotiations there is the umbrella group that consists of um, Australia Canada Japan New Zealand, uh, Norway, Russia, uh, United States. Then we have a group of uh, South American countries that's called ALBA. Of course, we have the basics, that's Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. So you see that actually also the uh, countries that participate in these groups, uh, they can also be member of other, uh, other groups as well. And then there are also the OPEC uh, oil exporting countries. And uh, these uh, groups are actually uh, more, yeah, how to say, um, the basics and OPEC countries are often also working together with LMDCs. While um, on the other hand, Umbrella Group is also a group of developed countries that sometimes works together with, with the EU. But of course, the US in this group has, um, has still different interests from the European Union in terms of uh, the legally binding uh, nature that the EU would like to see in the agreement that the Senate of the US is still not uh, able to accept. Um, then on the other side, you see more uh, pro-EU groups or like more ambitious groups. Um, and there are um, the Alliance of Small Island States, AOCs, and the least developed countries, LDCs. Um, EU has already tried in the past to uh, to get uh, an, a coalition uh, with these groups, especially in Durban in 2010. It was successful in doing so um, in the process towards concluding a new global agreement. Um, 
in Paris now um, the EU has been maybe a bit less successful in doing that uh, since Durban. Um, there's also in this context the African group, so I mentioned AOSIS, LDCs and then also the African group. Uh, the, these are the parties that the EU could uh, reach out to. Um, then there's also the Environmental Integrity Group, which is a group of um, Korea, Switzerland, Monaco, Mexico and Liechtenstein, which are also often supporting the EU's positions. Um, what happened in Warsaw was that um, maybe the EU uh, was not very successful in giving a positive um, input in terms of um, the finance discussion, that the EU was there um, um, maybe a bit uh, conservative in saying um, they weren't exactly sure what kind of um, commitments they could make and uh, did not have a clear plan of how to scale up uh, finance in the future. And of course for the developing countries, the LMDCs, this is a very important point uh, where um, they would really like to see clear commitments of the developed world in terms of finance and technology transfer and uh, as long as the EU and also other developed countries are not um, clearly committing themselves, they will also, towards uh, Paris, um, try to, to um, block clear progress and, and say in terms of the mitigation commitments that, uh, that the EU would like to see um, that, that China and India and other countries then likely will, will try to block this, this process. Shall I leave it there and then leave it open for further discussion later? Thank you. I would love thanks, thanks, Lisanne, indeed, for giving that overview of the of the international constellation. And you can certainly come in later on, perhaps, to make a few comments about what you would expect from from Paris and Lima, etc. Now it would be, before we turn to Thomas, would be myself um, giving a few comments. And I have prepared um, essentially for two areas. First of all, discussing a little bit where we are uh, in, uh, internally in the EU with respect to climate and energy policy and what the challenges are over the coming years and months. And secondly, a little bit about the expectations for Paris and Lima. Um, let me start with the with the internal EU situation. Um, obviously, approaching it in the context of international climate policy, um, the EU has, over the last decade certainly, um, probably a little bit longer, been called an EU uh, leader in, in international climate policy. Uh, I'm myself guilty of that um, several times. Um, and if you look at the literature, then there is a whole lot of um, emphasis also on the aspect of leadership by example. So basically doing the good thing internally, showing the world um, where it can and has to go and, and proving that climate policy is po possible, does not need to harm the economy, etc. Um, that has been especially strong, I guess, with the climate and energy package in 2008, but already building up in the years before. Now, that raises the question whether this is still the case, whether it will be the case towards Paris, um, and what it would actually take to maintain this kind of leadership by example and or regain it, as some would, would claim. Because there's a whole lot of criticism in the literature already that the EU is in danger of losing that kind of leadership by example role. Um, perhaps also reflecting a little bit about the importance of this leadership by example. In the past, the EU has relied on, on, on that um, leadership by example for its own influence in the world. It has also been able to partially um, rely on its weight in the issue area. I think if you think of the Kyoto Protocol negotiations, um, the EU has always been very important because it's one of the biggest emitters in that context. And that has been analyzed widely after Copenhagen that it's now clear that the EU's share in emissions is globally at around 12-13% and is declining. So it's less and less that the EU can rely on that aspect. If you look at the financial and economic crisis, it's also apparent that the EU can decreasingly rely on its economic weight in, in, in the world 
um, to exert its influence. So I would argue that it becomes even more important for the EU to lead by example, to have the credibility um, to, uh, of the action at home that drives then its inter international influence. Or if it doesn't drive it, then it at least supports it. Um, so if we look at the current discussions, we all know that we are in a difficult phase. Um, the EU still has to ratify the second commitment period amendment of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the noises that one hears out of the Council are that discussions are slightly um, blocked uh, in there, and one wonders what the big deal is, because the EU has also argued in the international negotiations in June and has shown convincingly that it will achieve its 2020 target. All the measures are in place internally. It will actually even overachieve the target. Um, so great. Uh, why, why can't it move forward on actually ratifying the damn thing? which is considered a uh, very important step by many developing countries. Or perhaps at this point in time, a little bit of a symbolic step, but symbolism sometime, sometimes can be important. And perhaps Maurizio can comment later on uh, what the situation is. And obviously the second big discussion that we have is the 2030 climate and energy package, where the Commission has suggested that there should be a 40% emission reduction goal domestically uh, by 2030. Um, in recent months, we have heard that there may be a 30% energy efficiency improvement um, goal, which may or may not be binding, needs to be discussed by, by heads of state, I guess. And the, 20, the famous 20% uh, renewables target that is binding at EU level, and still nobody knows what that exactly will mean. Um, the bigger challenge for the EU as a whole, I guess, is to establish in that context a, a framework for its governance in the areas of energy and industry connected to that, that will last over the coming years and decades and establish a system that, that gives the right signals to investors and, and society at large um, to decarbonize these areas. Um, and we can go into what that could mean. Um, Finally, I think what, what's also apparent to the world out there is that there is a lot of um, tensions within the EU among the now 28 member states what to do. Uh, obviously, always Poland is mentioned as a problematic case. Um, but it, it's clear that, um, that there are divergences within the EU, and that will raise in the negotiations, I think, also, again, the potential weakness of the EU as a strategic actor. Uh, behaving strategically and tactically, putting forward proposals that one perhaps sometimes know, knows uh, will not survive, uh, but pushing in the right direction. And we've experienced that in the past because of the interrelationship between external and internal action there in the EU, that uh, what some consider as a strategic move, uh, some others hang on to and say that's the substance of it and we can't move away from it. Uh, I guess that will be one, one element for the EU to consider also internally um, towards Lima and Paris. Let me say a few words then about Lima and Paris. And when I think about Lima and Paris, I start from the end point, and that is Paris. Against the backdrop of what Lisanne has said of the international constellation, and perhaps we want to take into account also the current geopolitics uh, of the more general nature, with uh, uh, wars in, in several regions of the of the world, um, an economic and financial crisis that at least is still keeping the EU very busy. Um, but as I said, also the geopolitics uh, in terms of, of security that um, are changing and, or have changed since Copenhagen quite dramatically. Um, against that backdrop, I think one needs to be realistic. Um, Climate is not as high on the agenda as, anymore as it, as it was. Um, at the same time, there is another opportunity here to, to reap uh, some of the fruits, I think, that have uh, developed over the past years. Um, there's obviously also some synergies possible between the energy security and the climate uh, agenda, and also that can be exploited. Um, but it very much leads me to what Maurizio already said before. I think that we cannot assume that there will be the solution in, um, in, in Paris. There will not be the ambitious treaty 
that all saves us and makes sure that uh, global temperature increase stays below two degrees um, from pre-industrial levels. Um, so what what my idea then would be that we need a kind of a, a stable treaty basis that provides a, and I always call that a double function of a signal and direction for international climate policy in the 21st century. And I think that was also what Maurizio mentioned, like it, it needs to be for the 21st century, it needs to be relatively stable, it needs to give the signal uh, to business, for investments, to governments, where the world is moving, that it's moving towards decarbonization. Um, and, and it needs to give that direction also that in the even as Paris and the agreement hopefully reached there will not be sufficient, um, there will be further developments and the direction of that development will be very clear. Um, so there are several elements of such a treaty or legal agreement, whatever you call it, we don't know exactly yet what the animal will be called, uh, that, that will amount to this signal and this signal of direction also. There is discussion about the long-term target potentially of decarbonization in the world, of a phase out of CO2 emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions somewhere in the second half of this century uh, that, that could be codified potentially. Um, and there, there could be signals, and Maurizio hinted at that again, that, that there will be a continuous strengthening process in the direction of this phase out. And that would go for mitigation, but I think one should also be realistic probably from a European and the developed country perspective, this will be about mitigation, should be moved in that direction. But I think this we can't have this without also giving the same signals for the other areas of the treaty. We'll also need to ident um, intensify international cooperation on adaptation. We'll need to uh, intensify the areas of financing, technology development and transfer, capacity building, what's called usually the means of implementation. And we'll need to have the signal also for what's called MRV, um, measuring, reporting, and verification, and, and compliance comes with it. Um, so we need, we need uh, as strong as possible commitments on these already in Paris, but on top of that, we need concrete procedures for, for stepping them up in the future. And a lot of that will then need to be specified, as Maurizio mentioned later on. Um, so what does that mean if you want that for Paris? What does that mean for Lima? Uh, it m means especially on the elements uh, of a negotiating text that we need to make much more progress than what we have currently on the table. Uh, because when you think about it, we need to have a full negotiating text, potentially something that could be um, ratified later on in May next year. Um, and at the moment we have bullet points that are not yet drafted in legal language and are not always that clear yet in, in the options that are presented on the table. Um, so we need um, uh, hopefully improved bullet points that make it clear what's to be worked on, on over the next half year to produce a real negotiating text. Um, because one of the lessons of Copenhagen is also if you don't have a good text on the table, uh, you will not be able, uh, even with the best efforts in the last hours anymore, to come up with something that, that makes really sen um, sense and lives up to the, to the challenge. Um, okay, that should be enough from, from my side. I think I've used up my time. Um, and with that, I, we can perhaps uh, turn to Thomas in Paris. The floor is yours. And then afterwards, we can have the discussion. And I think... Um, there are already uh, probably people thinking about some questions. Um, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be on this webinar. I'll keep it quite short so that there is time for uh, discussion and for uh, some questions. I just wanted to maybe step back and discuss some of the key uh, substantive issues that I see as, as crucial for the negotiations uh, between now and Paris. I think we can say that we're in uh, almost the opposite situation to, to Copenhagen. That is to say, uh, Copenhagen was characterized by a high degree of political and social attention on the issue of climate change. Um, participation in the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit was quite extraordinary. But it was also characterized by a high degree of divergence on the substantive issues of what kind of treaty we were trying to negotiate 
uh, with what kind of responsibilities for which parties. Um, there were big divergences on what we could call uh, the meta-negotiation. Uh, today, I think those divergences are significantly less. Um, the mandate for negotiation is relatively clear. We are heading towards a legal agreement, although there are still questions about what exactly is legal, legally binding. We're heading towards uh, an agreement that is applicable to all, uh, so a universal agreement, um, under the, uh, the principles of the conventions, but of course with, uh, with participation and contributions from, from all countries. So in comparison to Copenhagen, we have a situation in which there is much more, let's say, convergence around the kind of agreement that we want to have, but still uh, a lack of um, political and social attention to the issue which could help us to crack some of the uh, key issues that are still remaining for negotiation. <clears throat> and I think that's why the Ban Ki-moon summit today is so important. I wanted to address maybe what I see as four of these issues where there is still need for further work and, and, and further convergence. So the first one that I would mention is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, which of course is one of the guiding principles of um, the, uh, the Convention. There is, it seems to me, a kind of uh, conflict between the desire to have a universal long-term agreement, um, which Sebastian spoke about, uh, an agreement that is fit for the 21st century, and the need to reflect in that agreement some kind of state of the world today uh, in terms of the, the capacities and responsibilities of the parties. So a real question that we have is, how do we reflect that principle in a dynamic way? Uh, we've gone some way towards that with the concept of uh, intended nationally determined contributions, which is to say that each country can determine its own contribution and therefore there is a kind of self-determination of the, the equity principle. But there are other areas in the negotiations and in the climate regime where there is still uh, an expression of uh, responsibility and capacity which refers back to the annexes. Uh, and one of them notably is on the, the transparency regime that we have, which continues with, with a bifurcated regime between uh, developed and developing countries. Uh, another one is on, on financing, where uh, there is, a, a, let's say, a legal expectation that Annex 2 countries will contribute financing, but we know that um, m many uh, emerging, and in particular, some of the uh, more wealthy non-Annex 1 countries are big contributors to global capital flows. So an open question about whether they should also be thinking about how to green those financial flows. So for me, a key question is, how do we translate the principle of CBDR into a dynamic uh, principle? And how do we treat it in those areas of negotiations where there is still um, a black and white uh, or bifurcated uh, regime? The second element that I wanted to highlight was um, how do we live up to the two degrees target, which is obviously the guiding principle for the negotiations today. Um, I think it's been said before that it's unlikely that uh, the, the contributions which are put on the table in, in Paris will be sufficient uh, to keep global warming below two degrees. So the question is, what, what then? Um, I think there are a couple of elements that, that we need to consider. The first one is, as has been mentioned before, we need to have a cycle of commitments. Uh, so it's very clear that we'll come back to the table and, uh, and there will be a subsequent round of collective action where commitments can be strengthened. I personally am not a, a great believer in the revision of commitments during the commitment period. I think that once governments have made decisions on commitments, it's quite hard for them to go back on those decisions. And I think that as you move forward in a commitment period towards the end date, uh, that commitment becomes less and less relevant for the domestic investors and domestic economic actors who have much longer term horizons. So I think we should try and update ambition by setting new commitments that become then the point of reference. The second point that I would make here is that we need to have some kind of reference point for that ambition. We have it collectively uh, with regards to the two degrees objective. We don't have it individually. And I think it's very difficult to have it individually because of course uh, that relates to questions of burden sharing and so on. So I think one idea that we should explore is whether we could ask countries to start coming forward with longer term indicative pathways uh, for their emissions, which would allow us to have a reference point, um, a continuous reference point over time, 
because we know that in the long term what we need to do is very ambitious and that conditions what we need to do in the short term because of the inertia of our economic systems. So if we ask countries to put forward long-term indicative pathways, I think this would be a very important reference point that we can come back to continuously as we negotiate subsequent rounds of collective action. My third point is on finance. Obviously, this is uh, key to the negotiations today. Uh, we need to be able to live up to our commitments that we made in Copenhagen. Uh, the capitalisation of the Green Fund um, is a very important part of that. We need somehow to be able to show that we're living up to the commitment to mobilise $100 billion um, by 2020. I think if you read the analysis, we're about halfway there. The mobilised finance is around $50 billion per year uh, from north-south. Uh, I think this will be largely a, a political process to say, OK, we've, we've done enough, we're on, on the pathway to mobilising the $100 billion because accountability for what is actually uh, mobilised climate finance is very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to do. Um, and it's also not, in my view, uh, the, the core of the question. The core of the question is how can we mobilise collectively the, the finance that is necessary that goes much beyond um, the $100 billion per, per year by 2020. That's our political objective and we need to find uh, some kind of accommodation on that with further contributions for public financing uh, and so on. But we also need to, to sketch out how, after 2020, we shift the big investment flows that, that we need to shift, which are about a trillion uh, per year. Um, and that will be reliant, uh, to a significant extent, on domestic policy and also on smarter uh, public interventions from uh, multilateral development banks and, uh, and public assistance. But the, the core is domestic, uh, is domestic policy. And then uh, public investment and public uh, contributions can be the catalyzer. My final point, and I'll close with this one, uh, is on the issue of, uh, of review of implementation, which was touched upon before by Maurizio as uh, being an important point. Uh, this year, we will have the first round of um, the two processes for review of implementation that we have, namely international consultation and analysis and international assessment and review. I think there is a strong argument for strengthening these processes in the new agreement. Uh, I think uh, their, their weaknesses and deficiencies will become evident in the first round of these processes, in particular the fact that uh, the review will be taking place in the context of the SBI plenary, which is um, a rather unwieldy process. We need more time, we need more in-depth discussions to understand what countries what countries are actually implementing. So I think a key question will be, if we are to strengthen these processes uh, in the future agreement, where could that happen? Uh, could we create a special, uh, a special um, place for that to happen along the lines of the, of the Kyoto Protocol uh, Compliance Committee, maybe with a more facilitative than, a, than a, a compliance focus? So that's what I see as some of the, the, the real big issues for, for Paris going forward. And I'm very happy to take questions. And again, thanks for the invitation to Sebastian and IES. Thanks, uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, very, very nice. I think uh, how the how the different presentations are coming together. Um, we have one question already about the, uh, the the possibility of EU leadership towards Paris and um, actually also what has changed from Copenhagen in that respect. Um, and uh, But I'm sure Maurizio may also want to react to one or two things that may that, that were said. Um, so why don't I go back to Maurizio and give him the floor to react a little bit and perhaps also address the question that has been uh, has been uh, put already and at the same time I can invite all the 42 participants that I see out there in the world uh, to come up with further questions to us. Please Maurizio. Um, so there are maybe a couple of, couple of remarks, a couple of uh, answers to questions. Um, first of all, on uh, Let's call it EU action. Uh, there were there are two issues. There is the issue of uh, ratification of the Doha Amendment, and there is the issue of the 2030 package. 
that also relates to the question uh, that we have here from Ignatio on, 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 on uh, ambition and uh, differences between Copenhagen and, uh, and, and Paris. Uh, first of all, the second commitment period, well, as you say, Sebastian, I think it was uh, something that the EU offered during the negotiations in order to make sure that the negotiations could continue smoothly. Uh, we could have said also, I mean, uh, the second commitment period covers only uh, less than 15% of the emissions, so we should uh, do away with it and, and start uh, something new right away. Uh, we did want to, to, to continue this uh, because there are uh, very useful uh, elements in it that we can build upon. And we wanted oh, uh, as well to, to give some, some, uh, some, some signal to others uh, that we were uh, negotiating in good faith. So here we are. Um, uh, you know that for the ratification, uh, it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a lengthy process in the sense that we need the EU ratification, then the ratification of the 28 member states that then as a practice, usually in, in, in multilateral environmental agreements, uh, all of us deposit our instruments at, at, the, at the same time. So member states are progressing in their uh, uh, ratification. Uh, the EU is also progressing, uh, but it could maybe uh, go uh, a little bit faster. But uh, we've had the, the proposal for ratification decision by the Commission that has been discussed by Council. We have more or less closed the discussions uh, in Council. There is uh, one member state having some afterthoughts, so we, we uh, hope that these afterthoughts will be resolved quickly. Uh, in the meantime, we move with uh, the legal linguistic finalization of those texts. We will need, and it's a difficult process, therefore I'm, I'm trying to explain it, these texts, that is, that is the text of the EU ratification decision, will need to be agreed by Coreper and Council. They will need to be sent to the Parliament, because according to the treaties they need to give their consent. And then we will need to come back to Coreper and Council, where we will finally adopt the ratification decision. So basically, and knowing as well that we have Iceland there as well, with, uh, with which we have a, a, a bubble agreement, that means that additionally we need to have an international agreement between the EU and Iceland to do this, I would think that the EU uh, ratification would be ready uh, by, uh, let's say, the first quarter of next year. That's my wildest guess. And uh, that for uh, uh, the last member state, but because that's what we're looking at, the last member state in the EU ratifying I would say uh, uh, sometime by uh, the, the, the end of the first half of next year. So that, that's a little bit the, the schedule. So we're still on track uh, and we're going to do so. We've we, we have committed to do so and we'll do so. Uh, on uh, the 2030 package, you know that there the discussions are ongoing, uh, even if they are already in the, in, the lay, in, in, a lay, in, a, in the latest phases, let's say, because the decision uh, needs to be taken by uh, the European Council of EU Heads of State and Government at the end of October. Uh, I have good, good hope that uh, we will reach a decision. I mean, the, the proposals from the Commission are there. And I would say, I mean, uh, you can like them you or not, uh, but uh, the ambition is there in the sense that we've put forward a pathway, uh, uh, an indicative pathway that, well, it's even more than an indicative pathway that, that the EU has done. As, as, uh, Thomas has said, it would be interesting that all parties do uh, so. I mean, the EU has done so. It has done uh, it has put forward a long-term pathway until 2050, and it is on that basis that for 2030, the Commission has now put forward this 40% this target. Um, and then maybe a last point uh, that I wanted to say that is on, uh, on the presentation by Thomas. I found the the, the, the the various elements very interesting. The first element is really the the heart of the agreements. That's the principle of CBDR, that's the equity, and how we translate that. Uh, I had touched upon the fact that for uh, intended nationally determined contributions, that was the first step. I think we can further build upon that by, by saying that all the rules, for example, on, on MRV, on transparency, should be built not as they are now on, on the divide developing developed countries, but should be should be based on uh, the the type of commitments that that uh, each of the parties takes on. There you can have a, a separate separate rules on the basis of 
of the types of commitments that are taken. But it's true that it's something that needs to be well thought through and that, uh, in fact, is, is, is applicable to uh, uh, lots of the elements in that 2015 agreement. And so uh, time is short and uh, we need to think uh, uh, quickly on that. Thanks, Maurizio. Um, perhaps we just, for Thomas also, perhaps we just go around uh, as we did in the first round uh, to now going to Lisanne and see what uh, she has to say. And please, each of you, you see the comments that are coming in and the questions, uh, just uh, address them as you see fit, I would say, and I'll keep a little bit of an overview. Uh, for all of uh, the participants, it's five to one. We on our side have a little bit of flexibility to to go ten min minutes further or so uh, if the discussion stays interesting. Um, please, Lisanne. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. yeah sorry, <laughs> you couldn't hear me. Now I'm there. Uh, I was referring to the question by uh, Cecile Schneider. Uh, she asked about a uh, new Commission on Climate and Energy and will that allow the EU to play a stronger role towards Lima and Paris. Uh, well, I, uh, my uh, thoughts on this are, uh, we had Connie Hedegaard as the Climate Commissioner and I think she was a very strong uh, negotiator and also she was crucial in Durban uh, to get uh, to this uh, final agreement about having uh, the roadmap towards Paris there. And I think that uh, with this new commissioner who is, um, I think, not so experienced with the topic uh, yet, uh, it will be very difficult for him now to step in uh, in this process and uh, to uh, have the same uh, um, yeah, impact that Connie uh, used to have. And then also combining now the, the portfolios of climate and energy in one commissioner, I am afraid that this will... Um, this might lead to a, to a weakening of the, of the actual uh, actual uh, climate targets within climate and energy package. And also, if you see that there is now this uh, proposal of uh, having a, a person who will lead on the energy union, this Slovenian ex-prime minister. And there, if you combine that with uh, having now the climate and energy commissioner, then you also see already the strand that likely energy security and um, uh, Maybe uh, yeah, not not really fo focusing on climate mitigation and renewables uh, might might be uh, the way the EU will continue, and that's uh, I think in my pers perspective not very uh, positive. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just reading still the the new questions that are coming in. Um, That's to Maurizio, but we can obviously all um, comment on that. Um, well, I actually wanted to touch upon that also a little bit. Um, let me, yeah, the, the question of EU leadership, I think that's also about this question again, uh, and what, what the basis of that is uh, in the end. Um, I think back to the first question also, the, the situation from has changed quite significantly internationally, especially also since Copenhagen. So in, in my analysis also, it was never really the major point that the EU perhaps in the last days had some differing opinions on one or the other issue on whether to move to 30% and how much money exactly to, to make available in particular. Um, in, in Copenhagen, the, the, the bigger problem was that the EU was just uh, playing a different game than the other countries um, and, and was, was somehow in a different stadium or so, although in the same room. Um, so that, that has changed. I think people do much better understand now which game they are all playing. Um, and, and, and that that's, uh, has, has perhaps changed. What has also changed internally in the EU, I think that perhaps divergences have become a bit a bit more apparent. Uh, the policy priorities have moved, as I um, mentioned before. So I think in the climate area, we are much more looking at all those discussions um, that are called, uh, referred to as co-benefits, etc., energy security, energy efficiency, that it all plays in, 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 into uh, climate. 
um, in that sense, uh, things have changed, and the the leadership position of the EU will depend um, on how well it can portray itself and and can come up with solutions that are attractive also for others in that context. That comes back to the to the last question: How much are foreign actors actually looking at exactly what the EU is doing? My my own take would be that perhaps. Presenting something like 40% uh, looks quite good. Uh, it's also in line with what the Commission in their roadmaps in 2011, I think, had, had foreseen that, okay, we'll move from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80, something like that, or perhaps a little bit more than 80. Um, but um, the, the, the point there is more, and I don't know how, how well external actors will look at what's behind it, because just the situation since 2011 has changed quite dramatically since the, the last analyses were, were done. It's now much easier to get to minus 40 because of the crisis and, and other developments. Um, so if you want to really have a credible decarbonization pathway, you probably would want to move a bit, uh, a, a bit more ambitiously. Uh, especially also in the areas of renewables and um, energy efficiency that, that go along. Um, so, but um, yeah, perhaps Maurizio wants to, to um, comment on that and Thomas before that also. Just also a comment still on, um, I agree with the points that Thomas raised that are important. Um, and the, the idea of the longer term indicative pathways that, that parties should present, I think is something that, that looks very attractive. Um, what what would make it even um, make it more sense for me uh, would if that was in the context of this what I call the the, the phase out. Um, what I like about the phase out idea um, in, in Copenhagen we always discussed ah uh, yeah we need to globally we need to be at minus fifty percent uh, from nineteen ninety levels in twenty fifty, and that somehow gives you the idea well perhaps the others could do that. Uh, whereas the phase out makes it very clear, okay, we all need to reduce to what's called a net zero. So there could still be some emissions, but they need to be offset by uh, some things. Um, and, and, and that makes it very clear. Then the, the question is only who is phasing out by when. Uh, and my, my question basically to Thomas would be whether the long term pathways would basically be that. Tell me when you will be at zero. Uh, would, would that be a way forward on that? So perhaps with that, I can move to Thomas, actually. Please. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, it's an excellent segue. So um, let me try and, uh, with my short response, respond to the questions that Ian and, and Delia have answered. Um, and I think the way that we think about this question has been really structured by a project that we have been leading uh, together with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network called the Deep Decarbonisation Pathways Project, which uh, involves working together with modelling teams from 15 uh, major emitters, so all the big players are there, and they're all represented by national academic experts with an expertise in climate policy and emissions modelling. And the task that we set them was, model a long-term decarbonisation scenario for your country consistent with two degrees to 2050, consistent with your development priorities uh, and national circumstances and using your own uh, analytical tools. Um, and we did not in the project ever do any explicit burden sharing. The only uh, indicator that we gave them, and this links back to Sebastian's previous point, was to be consistent with two degrees, energy related emissions need to be about 1.7 tonnes per capita by 2050. So, See how close you can get to that, was the message that we gave to each team. Um, and then they went and ran the analysis, came, came back with a, a long-term pathway for their, for their uh, country, uh, and we discussed that pathway. Um, there, there are, for me, two lessons from this. Firstly, that process of discussing a pathway is extremely useful because it allows you to understand the context and content of uh, a country's ambition. So a country could say, well, I've got this challenge here and I can make this progress here and together that brings me about here in 2030. Uh, and the second point is that, so it's just to finish there, that iterative process of going back and forth and discussing between the secretariat of the project and, and the modelling teams was, was, was really useful. And we did 
get some improvements on the initial pathways proposed by uh, the country teams, some more ambitious pathways coming forward, because we found solutions to particular problems that, uh, that had come up. Uh, and the second point is that to understand ambition, we need to go beyond an aggregate perspective um, and look at the different sectors. Um, so, for example, uh, for a country that has a, a really heavy share of industry like China, what happens in that industrial sector is crucial for the, uh, the ambition that it can put on the table. So, taking a sectoral uh, perspective where we say you know, in 2050 or in 2030, the performance of this sector needs to be roughly this globally um, in order to be around two degrees. Uh, do you think that, that that is consistent with your pathway? Tell me what's happening in the sector in terms of demand, and in terms of the technologies that you're using. That enables a much more precise discussion on ambition. So to answer Jan's question, I think that the, the framework needs to have, uh, let, let's say, three elements. The first one is uh, short-term targets that can be uh, revised regularly. So. We, we are promoting what we call the 5 plus 5 structure, which uh, means five-year commitment periods with two, two time periods. So in 2015, countries agree to a, 20, uh, a 2025 target, uh, and they may put forward a 2030 target if they want to. In 2020, we come back to the table, countries agree to a 2030 target, and they may put forward a 2035 target. And in that way, we get some visibility, and we also have this dynamic of, uh, of adjusting commitments. The second element is uh, these, these long-term pathways. Uh, and so Sebastian is right, they need some kind of reference point. And the long-term reference point is pretty clear, that we do need to be uh, at net zero in the second half of the century. And indeed, in framing it in, in terms of this long-term ambition makes it pretty clear that everyone needs to act right now uh, in order for us to be able to get there. So, that is where the, um, the 1.7 tonne indicator, uh, for example, that we gave per capita in 2050, which is quite coherent with a phase out in the second half of the century, was so useful because to get to 1.7 tonnes, you have to start acting right now. So that long-term benchmark is, is really useful. And the third element which I, would, which I would say we need is some kind of framework to allow us to discuss in much more detail what countries uh, propose in terms of ambition, uh, so this could be part of the transparency mechanism, where we have a detailed discussion, okay, that's your INDC, great, we accept it, now let's talk about how you plan to put it uh, into practice, what are the contributions of the different sectors, how do you see them evolving over time, how does this compare with your, your long-term pathway. Not in a punitive sense, not in the sense of uh, a part of a compliance uh, procedure, but in the sense of creating as much understanding uh, for uh, the next round of collective action linking back to the, the first point. And just to close, I can put the links to all of the, the projects that I mentioned. I'll, I'll type them up right now. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. Um, this, did your uh, response also already refer to what Delia asked, how, how essentially one would um, assess whatever comes forward uh, in next year and, and if it doesn't add up, what, what to do then, uh, apart from ratcheting up. Um, any further ideas from you or from, from anyone else about, about that, what to do in that case? I could make a very, very brief comment because I didn't address it directly. Um, so I think uh, the likelihood that we would have a multilateral agreed assessment of where we are in, in 2015 is, is relatively low. Um, we will have some kind of internal consultation within UNFCCC. We will have all of the research teams, ourselves included, doing their own analysis, probably the unit gap report, uh, and so on. There are many activities that will allow us to get a sense of uh, where we are collectively. So I'm not sure that uh, we need to waste negotiation time on this particular question in a huge amount of, of detail, because I think it will be difficult to achieve. So once, w once we are in 2015, I think the overall structure of the agreement is crucial, and I uh, mentioned the three points that we see as important to that. The second point is, I think we should think about what we can do with, with WorldStream 2, which um, in my view has, has not been uh, very effective so far in terms of raising ambition. So an open question is, 
whether we can find more effective frameworks for raising ambition alongside uh, the INDCs that have been proposed, whether it could be on a sectoral basis with countries agreeing to implement a bit more in terms of renewables or something like that. Finding a framework that allows us, while we work on implementing our INDCs, to continue ratcheting up uh, ambition elsewhere is, I think, very important. It may be that much of that takes place outside of the UNFCCC, but at least if we can find a framework where that is encouraged and recognised inside the UNFCCC, then I think that would be very positive. I think it's more difficult to see the UNFCCC becoming some kind of locus for negotiation for these for these initiatives. Thank, thanks, Thomas. Um, and then your work stream too, for those out there in the world who may not be that familiar, that's the, the what happens pre-2020. Um, so perhaps um, we can, it's, it's nearly 10 past one, but any closing uh, remarks? Um, I'll just go around and ask whether anyone has to add anything also with respect to the, to the questions that have, been, um, that have been posed. And thanks, Thomas, for providing the links to the, to the reports right now. Um, Maurizio, any last words? Well, maybe. <clears throat> Uh, an answer to a question by my colleagues and by others. Uh, that is, uh, is the world looking at what the EU is doing and mm -hmm. how will this influence uh, uh, national negotiations and vice versa? I think that basically, uh, I don't think it makes a lot of a difference if the EU goes for 40 or 45 percent. What makes a lot of difference is how it gets there, that is, the instruments it is using, and if uh, they can be made fit for purpose for the future. Uh, and second, uh, if it gets there, because the EU, now in the discussions for the 2030 package, for example, is clearly demonstrating that while we have uh, some diverse situation in the member states, which is a little bit like in the international negotiations, still we can get to, to a solution, to a fair burden sharing. So I would say in, 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 in those ways, it is uh, the EU can, can set an example uh, in making clear that it is possible to get an agreement and in making sure that the instruments that it uses for its climate policies are the right ones and that they evolve with, uh, with the time. Thank you, Maurizio. Perhaps one, one question I have for you still. Um, because Thomas was saying um, perhaps it's better to move in five-year steps in 2025, and we just heard that the US, I think, made that point in a submission, uh, suggesting, okay, let's go for 2025 rather than locking in too low ambition for 2030 already. Uh, would that be at all a, a problem for the EU? Because, I mean, in the EU debates, we only know 2030, 2030 framework, etc. So what's what's the 2025 perspective? Do you have any view on that? Difficult spot, <laughs> but um, uh, I would say that uh, since uh, the, the intended nationally determined contributions uh, uh, cater to national circumstances and there is some, 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 uh, some, some space there, I would say that you would need to uh, uh, give the possibility to go for a five-year or a ten-year uh, period. And then uh, the, the, the adjustments and the upward adjustments and so on would be on that basis as well. I think that, uh, well, I, I've not gone really into the detail of everything, but I think that should be possible. I mean, that you give the possibility to some to go for a five year, to others for a 10 year, and then that you make on that basis the, 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 uh, the, the, the cycle of commitments. But still to be discussed within the EU as well, I would say. Sure. I, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, I just thought perhaps you had some, some thinking that can be shared. Uh, and obviously, the point has already been made in the discussion that once you have a 2030 target, it's also not so difficult if, if we assume that it's roughly the same instruments by which we uh, implement them with some kind of linear trajectory towards it to then uh, calculate what it would mean for 2025. Um, that, that's more mathematical than, than political, then, if everyone has agreed on that. Um, but let's turn to Lisanne. Any last comments?
Well, considering the time, I guess I should be very brief. Um, I've seen another question by Erika, who refers to an uh, article in The Economist, and I actually also read this, and I was quite, it was quite interesting to see that there are the, the, the instruments with which the most uh, climate mitigation, uh, or like the, the most uh, uh, the degree of, of, of greenhouse gas emission reduction was achieved, was uh, actually the Montreal Protocol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, yeah, that's, that, you, uh, that gives an example that uh, actually, uh, actually an uh, international instrument can be effective. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that still the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is a very important instrument to set these international uh, rules. And then, of course, it's very important that, that the, uh, the countries who are parties to the agreement uh, actually implement uh, the measures. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. And uh, since I have already taken the liberty to put people on the spot in between, I'll also pass uh, my last comment. Uh, Thomas, any last words from your side? No, I've spoken quite a lot. So just again, thanks for the invitation and for the questions. Thanks then uh, to, to everybody. It's a quarter past one. Um, we have exhausted the agenda. I think we have also tried to respond to the questions that were out there. Thanks very much for all of uh, you who have participated uh, in, in the roundtable webinar. Uh, the first time I've been doing this, a uh, very positive experience, I have to say. It, it, it does work and one can uh, discuss without flying people or getting them on the train to, to Brussels. Uh, so it's probably even uh, climate friendly. So perhaps something will continue. So just uh, check our announcements. Um, I'm looking forward to the to the next occasion. Thanks very much to Maurizio, Lisanne, and, and Thomas, and to all of you out there. Um, thanks very much, and hope to be in touch soon. Bye-bye.